Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to our committee chair, Ruth DeFries, to get us going. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us, to John and everyone who's joined us online here. What we'll do is do a brief introduction of our committee. We have many people here in person. We have a few people online. And then uh, turn it to you to introduce uh, yourselves briefly about who is here with us. And then we will look forward to uh, presentation and discussion. So we will just quickly go around the room so you can know uh, our committee members a bit. So we'll start with Jen and then go around and then we'll get the people who are online. Hi, I'm Jen Ledto and I'm with the Canadian Rivers Institute and University of New Brunswick. And please turn on your mic. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Fernando Dela. I served time as uh, an undersecretary of state in Mexico and also as a, a tenured professor. Hello, I'm Danielle Ignace. I'm an associate professor in forest resources at the University of Minnesota. I'm also an enrolled member of the Coeur d'Alene tribe in Northern Idaho and Menominee in Wisconsin. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Cliff Duke. I am director of the Academy's Board on Environmental Studies and Toxicology, part of the group supporting this effort. Good afternoon. My name is Apoorva Dave. I'm a senior program officer at the National Academies and part of the study team. Oh, April already introduced herself. I'm Ruth DeFries. I'm, I'm chairing this committee, and I am an ecologist from Columbia University in New York. I'm Christina Eisenberg. I'm an Associate Dean of Inclusive Excellence and Director of Tribal Initiatives at Oregon State University in the College of Forestry. Hi, I'm Pam McAwee. I am a Professor of Human Ecology at Rutgers University in New Jersey. Uh, hi, I'm John Robinson. I'm with the Wildlife Conservation Society out of New York. Hi, everybody. Hi everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm Patrick Gonzalez, a climate change scientist and forest ecologist at the University of California, Berkeley, and previously principal climate change scientist of the U.S. National Park Service. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Peter Oster. I'm a, a senior research scientist at Mystic Aquarium and research professor emeritus of marine sciences at University of Connecticut. Okay, thank you. And we have a few committee members online. Krista? Hi, everyone. I'm Krista Caps. I'm an associate professor of ecology at the Odom School of Ecology in the Savannah River Ecology Lab at the University of Georgia. And Rudolfo? Good afternoon, everybody. Rudolfo Dirso from uh, Stanford University in the biology department. Thank you. And I'm not sure if Susanna is with us or not. She's attending another meeting in Norway or somewhere. Iceland, sorry, Iceland. Okay, thank you. So that is our committee. Karen, I'm sorry, Karen. How did I forget you? Not a problem. Karen Lips, University of Maryland, College Park. And I, I am Gerardo Ceballos. I'm a professor at the National University of Mexico working in ecology and conservation. Okay, thank you. Did we get all of our committee? Okay, good. So uh, so that's us. So I will turn it over to you, John, about um, who is online with us. Okay, we'll start with myself. I'm John Bradford. I'm a research ecologist with the US Geological Survey. I work on drylands and climate change. Um, and I don't know, Kian, I don't, do you wanna announce yourself? Hi, everybody. Um, it's nice to be with you. My name is Hien Ngo. I am the person that's facilitating and implementing this assessment and supporting all of the great experts that are doing the work uh, that you see. Thank you. And Hien, I don't know if we should go through everybody else that's on. I'm not sure who all is on, to be honest. Um, yeah, April, should we go through uh, everyone else that's online or... Well one thing that we could do is if uh, people who are online can introduce themselves on the chat, if they can give their name and their um, 
and their institution and their role in this assessment. Can we do it that way? Hello, welcome, please join us. Let you take your coat off and then ask you to introduce yourself. We had a, a guest in the room. Hi everyone, my name is Janet Cushing. I am with the Department of the Interior and I am one of the lead authors for Chapter 8B. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for coming in person. Okay, so I think we can move on to um, John's presentation to give us an overview of the process for this assessment and the draft that we have, uh, we've seen. Yeah, thank you, Ruth. Uh, hopefully you're seeing the slides. Yes. Great, thanks. So, yeah, so he and I pulled these slides together, but I just, before we even get started, I wanna acknowledge that we are really just the spokesmen for a very large team, um, many of which are either in the room uh, as Janet is or online with us today. So. Uh, we're just speaking, but this is a, definitely a team effort, and you'll get a feel for that in some of the slides as we go forward. So what I hope to do relatively briefly is talk through you know, four things for you. One, the origins of this assessment, where it came from, a little bit about the structure, uh, how you know what, what's comprised in the assessment, where we are in terms of the overall progress and, and our timeline, and then end with some thoughts about specific thoughts about how your committee's input can be incorporated going forward into this assessment. So starting with a little bit about the origin. So why are we conducting a national assessment of biodiversity and climate change? Uh, this is really building on the strength and successes uh, in past years of IPES, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Uh, IPES is an inter in independent intergovernmental body uh, in the past couple of years has produced some pretty influential reports, uh, a global assessment in 2019 and in 2021, a workshop on biodiversity and climate change that have really, I think, set the standard for thinking about the interactions of biodiversity and ecosystem services and climate change. Um, and this work is sort of trying to take some of those same successes and focus them on the North American region. Uh, the United States, as well as Canada and Mexico, are all member parties to IPES, and the U.S. Geological Survey is the science lead for the U.S. delegation to IPES, which explains a little bit about why the USGS is playing kind of the lead role in the development of this overall report. Um, it's also fair to say that, that this... This effort was motivated by Jane Lubchenco's 2021 challenge to advance science uh, and inform decisions uh, within the, the, the scientific and federal context. Uh, a little bit of the history. In fiscal year 22, Congress provided funding to the Department of Interior, which is where the U.S. Geological Survey is, for an assessment of biodiversity and climate change. Uh, Canada and Mexico expressed interest in joining in the effort, and so the overall assessment evolved into the Biodiversity and Climate Change Assessment of North America and the U.S. Affiliated Pacific Islands. That's a lot, so we just call it the BCCA. Um, it is truly, I think, and we've worked hard to make this an international effort. The, the lead governmental organizations uh, within the three countries are the USGS for the United States, ECCC for Canada, and Canabio for Mexico. I looked through the um, your, your committee's composition. It was really great to see lots of folks with very strong connections to Canada and Mexico, because I think that'll be really strengthen your ability to help us make sure that we're on target here. Um, after that, in fiscal 22, the late, later in fiscal 22, the National Nature Assessment was established by executive order. And as a result, one outcome that we were seeking to provide from the BCCA is a technical input to the National Nature Assessment. And I'll describe more about kind of how we perceive that here in a couple of slides. So a little bit about the overall goals. I mean, obviously our, our biggest picture here is to conduct the first North American assessment of the connections between biodiversity and climate change. We do hope and we're trying to de generate decision relevant information. So our primary audience is decision makers. Um, our assessment topics and structure are driven by policy and management questions. And we'll talk more about kind of what we mean by that in a minute. Um, we're conducting a systematic synthesis of the available evidence and knowledge. We hope to be policy informative, but because we are a government, governmental report, we cannot be policy prescriptive. 
we've tried to focus on solutions or at least opportunities for um, better decisions structures. Um, and, and you'll hear more about this in a minute, but chapter eight is over half of the assessment authorship. And that's the chapter where we really dig into exploring uh, ways for improving the decision context uh, across a, a broad gradient of sort of decision makers. We've also tried very hard to be representative of diverse perspectives. So we convened an author team from that has a variety of sectors. We have early career folks, we have social scientists, natural scientists, indigenous knowledge holders and practitioners that include policymakers and land managers uh, to try to get representation from a broad array of folks so that this, this assessment can be as useful as possible to that same broad array of, of, of individuals. Um, we are also being intentional and in, in at least doing what we can to incorporate diverse knowledge systems throughout the assessment. We have indigenous scholars in almost all the chapters and our um, indigenous scholars have have self-organized, and I'll mention this again later, to, to develop a little, some methodology methodology or guidance for including appropriately including different knowledge systems. And we think that's something that's a real step forward. Um, lastly, one of our goals is, of course, to provide detailed technical input to other assessments that may not have the bandwidth to go into that level of depth. This includes the National Nature Assessment, uh, the upcoming uh, sixth NCA, uh, as well as international IPCC and IPES global assessments. So one of the questions we get quite a bit is how is this assessment related to uh, the National Nature Assessment? And one way to think about that is depicted in this diagram here. On the vertical axis is depth, sort of how much, de how, how deep can you go in a particular topic and across the top in the horizontal axis is breadth. You can see the national nature assessment spans all of nature and the national climate assessment spans all of climate. They of course interact in some, in some ways and that interaction is really where the BCCA focuses. But because we are more focused topically, we have the opportunity to go into much greater depth in the specific interactions of biodiversity and climate change. And so we, we're trying to, to push that depth a little bit deeper uh, as much as possible. And this is relevant when we think about the types of audiences that we're hoping to address. So as you go from uh, deeper into depth, you can move from informing the public into forming legislatures and you get a little deeper, you can inform policy makers, perhaps within agencies, all the way down to, to potentially actually influencing and providing useful information for practitioners that are somewhat on the ground. And so this, these, this, this gradient includes federal, state, local governments, indigenous and First Nation communities, as well as NGOs and private industry. And so we're trying to think about it this way. We've really charged our authors to, to try to do what they can to recognize the need for actionable information across this gradient of decision makers. Um, and one way to think about this, and one way that we sort of conceptualize the opportunity that's specific to the BCCA is to explore across this gradient of decision space what the current decision space is shown there on the right, and then how that decision space might be able to be improved if we had some different structures that might enable more effective conservation of biodiversity in the context of climate change. And so we recognize this is a big challenge. It's a daunting challenge. We're not gonna do it perfectly, but we are you know, charging our authors and advocating for them to think clearly about what this might mean and, and do what they can to explore uh, the, the potential for improving that decision space um, across that gradient as much as possible. So that gives you a feel for kind of where this assessment came from and, and what we're trying to do and what we think and hope is novel about it. Um, a little bit about the structure. We have uh, six co-chairs of which I am one. I'll, I'll mention the others here in just a second. We have a guidance committee of about 30 people that is convened by the Udall Foundation for which we are very grateful. Uh, and then we have a whole broad array of, chap of chapter authors. We have coordinating lead authors for each chapter, lead authors, contributing authors, also fellows that can contribute to, to, to writing chapters. That's really where obviously the, the line share of the work happens. And we're very grateful for all the work that the authors are putting in. We're also working to convene and identify a set of review editors whose primary job will be to ensure that the valuable comments we get from all sources, including this committee, will be appropriately integrated into, into future versions and drafts of the assessment. Um, I'll go into each of these, most of these components in a little bit more detail here. So the co-chairs, as I mentioned, we have six. I am one on the upper right there. The other federal co-chair is Stephanie Actipas of the Department of State. We have two other co-chairs from the United States in the upper left, Maria Carmen Lemos, who's a social scientist from the University of Michigan, and Kyle White, at the, also at the University of Michigan, is an expert in indigenous knowledges and natural resource management. Uh, we have one co-chair each from Mexico and Canada. From Mexico is Ernesto Ankerlink, who's a terrestrial ecologist, and from Canada, Isabel Cote, who's a marine ecologist. So these are the, the, the co-chairs 
we're working to provide general oversight, help convene the authors, make sure that everything is moving forward and appropriately structured. Also critical is the guidance committee. This is about, as I mentioned, 30 folks or so uh, uh, convened by the, the, the Udall Center. Um, they have a really broad expertise uh, in the natural sciences, social sciences, as well as resource management and utilization. We're very grateful for uh, the input that this, this guidance committee provides, including some of the folks with, with quite deep experience in international and national assessments. So there's a lot of, of expertise that we're able to tap into here that helps us um, keep moving and, and be very effective. We're grateful for this. Of course, I think we're most grateful for the author team. I think it might be more than 135 now. I'm not sure what the current count is, but um, our authors, uh, this picture is from our, our all author meeting we had uh, earlier this year. A little less than half are from the United States, about a third are from Canada, and about 20% are from Mexico. Roughly three quarters uh, are in academia, about 16% are federal employees, and then we have representation from both NGOs and lawyers. Uh, we have Reasonably equitable split, about 40% males, 60% females. We have quite uh, even split between natural scientists, about half, and social or interdisciplinary scientists, about half as well. And that's a recognition sort of in the value and the need to incorporate the social sciences component if we're going to have actionable, effective information. So that gives you a feel for most of the major players involved in this assessment. Moving into just a little bit of glimpse into the structure, you should all have the, the current first order draft, all thousand and twenty five pages or so it is. But just as a reminder about the high level structure, we have uh, nine overall chapters and we sort of think about the first two of these as setting the context. The first one provides a general introduction to this topic as well as some history of biodiversity conservation across these three countries. Chapter two digs into understanding the relevant laws and policy documents. This is really trying to understand what we're thinking of as the current decision space. And this has subchapters, again, for each of the three countries, as well as a transboundary subchapter. Then chapters three through seven could be thought of as kind of the meat of the science synthesis. Um, in which we really try to perform systematic reviews and understand you know, the state of knowledge. These explore topics like the direct effect of climate change on biodiversity, interactions of climate change with other drivers of biodiversity, consequences of biodiversity change for ecosystem services, interactions among climate change, climate mitigation, adaptation, and biodiversity conservation, and biodiversity in a regional and international context. And then once we've kind of summarized and, and, and reviewed the state of knowledge on those important topics, we then return to the decision structures in chapter eight, where we explore policy options and potential solutions in this complex and changing environment. Chapter eight, again, has subchapters for each country, as well as a transboundary subchapter. Um, and this is where we encourage authors to explore a potentially improved decision space, what might be able to be done differently to maximize our, the effectiveness of our biodiversity conservation. And then chapter nine provides a synthesis, explores and identifies important knowledge gaps and thinks about the outlook for the future. So this is the, the very high level perspective on what's in the assessment. And of course you have the draft to dig into this in more detail. I know we're, we wanted to keep this presentation pretty short, so I won't read all of these, but these are designed to give you some flavor, flavor for the type of policy relevant questions that we're hoping that this assessment will explore. So how are, are climate change and biodiversity connected? What are the status and trends? How do these, how does climate change interact with other drivers? Can we identify vulnerable species, populations, or ecosystems? Are there thresholds we should keep in mind? Are there important intervention points? Are there barriers, challenges, or threats? Um, do we anticipate conflicts and potential opportunities between mitigation, adaptation, and biodiversity conservation? Uh, and then, of course, how and where can we find policy options that might be implemented and coordinated to allow more effective uh, con conservation of biodiversity across jurisdictional boundaries? So this is just a flavor for the kind of things we're hoping to explore, and there's a lot more in the, in the draft. Okay, sort of where are we in our progress? Uh, this is about a two and a half year process. It started late in 2022 with the development of, of a prospectus. 2023, we convened the authors and developed the first draft outline. Uh, as I mentioned already earlier this year, we had an all author meeting uh, in the spring of 2024. Right now we are at the stage of our first review, first public review, uh, which includes the draft that you have and you'll be providing comments on. Looking forward, we're planning to integrate all the comments from that and develop a second co complete draft by about middle of 2025. And we're hoping for a launch at uh, the end of 2025. So this is a pretty accelerated process compared to a lot of assessments. And um, our authors have been very gracious in, in trying to help us meet this timeline, but it's pretty accelerated. And that 
that helps us think a little bit about sort of that timeline and what does it mean for the engagement with your committee's report. Um, we're expecting this, this that our second internal review, which will be 100% draft, uh, will be sometime around March of 2025, which is, I think, going to be fairly fairly consistent with when your report will be available for us to start using to integrate your comments. And so I think it should time pretty well to have that second complete draft at about the same time that your report comes out. It's worth noting that the chapters will still be in flux uh, until the, at least the second quarter of 2025. Um, so again, I think there will be an opportunity to, to integrate your, your input, despite the fact that we're on a very rapid timeline. Um, so the statement of the task uh, to your committee, you know, in part requests to review the chapters and assess whether the chapters adequately and transparently assess the relevant scientific literature and evidence addressing the most pressing issues of biodiversity and climate change. That's sort of the, the what we're hoping for from you in a nutshell. A little bit more digging into that. Um, some of the things that you might choose to comment on, again, the relevance of the, con of the content. Do the chapters meet that adequate and transparent threshold that we identified? Um, in particular, is there any important interactions among biodiversity and climate change that the assessment is missing? Missing anything that we should we should at least acknowledge that we didn't have the time to incorporate uh, comprehensively, um, but we'll you know certainly do what we can with the time available to to address anything that we may have missed. It's also worth exploring are there additional innovative procedural steps um, that we could try to consider. And just as a reminder, we've you know worked hard to have diverse authors. We're working to include diverse knowledge systems. We have formal input from tribal leaders via government to government consultations that are ongoing right now. We're working to, to integrate and utilize some of the sort of relatively uh, recent theory of change and systematic change in chapter eight in particular. Uh, and we're hoping to have a critical reflection on the sort of value and utility of assessments itself, which I don't think has been done before. And then lastly, and near and dear to my own heart, working for the U.S. Geological Survey and working with land managers a lot, we are working to engage with, with decision makers at the sort of lower level of that gradient that I showed earlier, folks that are sort of closer to the ground trying to make decisions. Um, for example, we've had a couple of meetings with the Bureau of Land Management Resource Managers to try to increase the broad relevance of this assessment. Um, so, you know, one of the big things that that uh, I think we would love input on is, is you know, this is the first regional assessment of these two challenges together. So if you can help us, uh, you know, figure out how we can expand the reach and relevance of this assessment to various end users, I think that would be extremely valuable. All right, the last slide, trying to keep this to 15 minutes to keep, keep April happy here. Um, the last slide is just to make you aware of the coordination among chapters. This is a, a pretty large assessment. We, you know, our first our first not even complete draft is more than a thousand chapters. We recognize there's a lot going on. There's 130 some authors. So we're trying to be very intentional in ensuring effective coordination among chapters. In the past, we've had two internal reviews that included the guidance committee to try to ensure consistency and complementarity among chapters. We had that in-person all author meeting, which included explicit time for the, for the authors of different chapters to coordinate and make sure they're on the same page. We're having ongoing virtual meetings among the chapter eight subsections and going to continue that and, and expand to include the chapter two subsections. Uh, looking forward, we're going to have a third internal review with the guidance committee um, in early 2025. We have uh, another in-person meeting focused on the policy implementation parts of the, of the assessment, which is really chapters one and eight and nine to sort of finalize and coordinate that really important contact content before the second public review. That'll happen in February of 2025 in Tucson. Um, we are working to uh, enable coordination to ensure that each that, that we have case study alignment and what we're calling cross chapter thematic arcs. So we're, we're encouraging the chapters to consider where we could have examples of the ways that climate change is interacting with biodiversity that span across chapters. So for example, we might have one of the topics that came up in our all author meeting was to have some some boxes or sidebars that explore the challenges of, of, of managing and conserving salmon resources uh, in chapters two and sort of what are the current structures that, got, that, that, that constrain management of salmon. And then in chapters three through seven, as appropriate, we re, re, you know, touch on issues of what we know about what's, what's impacting salmon populations. And then maybe in chapter eight, we might again touch on salmon and think about how might that be able to be done more effectively if that decision space was was modified in some way. So these these cross chapter thematic arcs, I think, could be really powerful to help readers sort of see how this overall assessment is structured and see the value in, in for particular resources. We have 
not uh, standardize the methods for reviewing available evidence and knowledge. This allows the, the chapter coordinating lead authors to use the methods that are most effective and appropriate for their particular topic. Um, and we have, as I mentioned earlier, have a self-convened Indigenous Knowledges Caucus that has uh, developed some guidance on how to appropriately integrate and weave Indigenous Knowledges into the, into the chapters. And we're very, very grateful for that. And with that, that's the last slide I have. I'm happy to take questions and to, to, to direct questions to other folks uh, from the assessment that are online. And maybe unless there's unless people want to return to slides, I could stop sharing. Yeah, thank you so much, John. That was really helpful and answered some of the questions that we were asking <laughs> this morning. Um, so thank you so much for that. Yes. We'll just shoot questions at you. Is that okay? And then if you want to answer it or anyone on your in your group uh, wants to answer, then um, we can sure. have a discussion. Yeah, you can pose them to me and I'll see what I can do. We'll yeah. The intent here is to figure out how the work of this committee can be most useful for uh, for the process that you have and make this assessment useful. This is a very complicated space. <laughs> biodiversity and, and climate change. So I want to, I'll, I'll go with the first question and uh, and then the whole committee can chime in here. So I want to drill down on this, um, this decision-making space that you laid out. So you laid out the, um, the you know, government policies, NGOs, local government, uh, tribal governments, you, you, you laid that out. But can we drill down on that, like, who do you envision is really the intended audience for this assessment? And with what policies would you, are you sort of aiming to, um, to influence with this assessment? There's so many possibilities here. How do we get a handle on um, the intended audience and how the, how the assessment will be used? Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, our hope is to provide some information about, you know, how if the decision space was were altered, that we'd have more flexibility to 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 make effective conservation decisions. You know, I'll I'll be the first to admit that uh, there's no way we're going to provide actionable specific information for every natural resource manager on a piece of ground, all, you know, all over these all over the continent. Um, but maybe what we we are hoping to do is do systematic reviews to say where there is sufficient evidence that climate change is impacting one component of biodiversity or not in the direction in which it's impacting it, which can help provide, uh, I think, fodder for decision makers at different levels to think differently about the, the motivations for their decisions. So at the lowest level, well, I don't know if it's the lowest level, but um, one of the questions we've struggled with is how could this be relevant for, for folks, example, you know, doing um, NEPA documents, which is a lot of what some of the federal agencies end up doing. And part of what they're they're struggling with, at least from my impression of talking to some of these these folks, is when is there sufficient evidence they need to consider a factor that they haven't considered in the past? When is there sufficient evidence that uh, they they that they're justified in doing something differently than has been historically done on their on their piece of land or or natural resource? Um, and so I think there's opportunities to provide some of that evidence in those chapters three through seven. Um, I think it's also true that. As much as we are hoping and trying to be relevant as far down that gradient of decision makers as we can be, um, I think a lot of our what what might be novel about our insights are perhaps not all the way down to the practitioners on the ground, but maybe at the at the sort of policy makers or um, decision makers at the sort of agency lead uh, uh, in, in those kind of roles where, for example, agency leads at Bureau of Land Management might reconsider if they want to think about increasing aridification as a motivation for uh, considering alternative uh, grazing permits in the Southwest. And I'm just making that up. Um, whereas that hasn't been considered necessarily in the past. And it's, I don't know if that helps a lot, but I, I'm, I guess I'm suggesting that, you know, we're trying to hit as much, if, if we can hit some of those lower level folks, but if nothing else, provide syntheses about what we know that can help them feel justified in considering new factors in their decisions. That's my quick answer, and then I'll I'll throw it to I don't know I see I see Steve Jackson on there I don't know if he or anybody else um, I know Liana you're on there maybe you've got some thoughts that would would add to that.
Yeah, I can I can provide yeah uh, a little bit of a, a somewhat different approach, John. Um, so at least speaking for the U.S., much of the environmental law and policy that we work with was developed in the 20th century before climate change really became an issue. And so one of the 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 goals of this effort is to crosswalk that existing law and policy that will be outlined in chapter two with the knowledge that we're getting about the climate change implications for uh, biodiversity and uh, the, the implications of both climate change itself and adaptation and mitigation efforts and how those will influence biodiversity. So uh, among the things that I think we're, we're hoping to see come out of this, uh, particularly in the synthesis chapters uh, eight and nine, are to identify both the identify the gaps um, where uh, in the um, the potential contradictions between much of the 20th century legacy of environmental policy and uh, climate change, and uh, so identify what what we're missing, where are the gaps. Uh, in the existing law and policy, and where are the contradictions? Where are things going to actually break down or work against us uh, in uh, going into a, a world of climate change? Um, and uh, and then identifying, you know, there are also going to be opportunities. Uh, uh, I think uh, in uh, in that space. Yeah, maybe another way to express that is that you know we're trying to consider questions about how does do, do the do the constraints, the decision spaces, the policies, the procedures, how might they need to be modified, recognizing that we're no longer in a static environmental context. We have long-term directional change, and that means we need to be probably responsive in some ways we haven't been. Another example that I think might be worth considering is one that I hear a lot um, that's a, a, a sort of baked-in structural challenge in that in many parts of the, at least the U.S., the wildlife populations are managed by the states, but the habitat, the, the land resources, are often managed by the federal government. And that creates, if nothing else, um, logistical challenges in coordinating the management of those of the habitat and, and, the, and the wildlife populations. And so, you know, one thing we might explore is are there, are there apparent ways to make that more, more fluid, more effective in management, which has to be more, more responsive in this time of change. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's really helpful. The specific uh, specific examples uh, really bring it to life. So thanks for that. I'm going to throw it open to the committee. Uh, Jen has thank a question. You. Uh, thank you for the presentation. As Ruth said, it did clear up some things, uh, but just to ask a little bit more in terms of the structure of the report, um, we were kind of wondering what might the what do you envision the final assessment's going to look like in terms of its total length, knowing that right now not all the sections are completed, there's a lot of placeholders in there, um, and not just total length of the entire report, but length in terms of the balance between the different chapters. Um, and you touched on this a little bit, but just if you could give us a bit more on that, um, as well as the, the structure of the chapters and how connected they're going to be, how connected material will be across the chapters. Um. Yeah, as you noted, and as the draft reflects right now, this first order draft, they're, they're, the chapters are at different states of development. Um, and obviously, we anticipate that there will be much more parity between in the in the sort of length and context and content of the different chapters uh, when it's finalized. Uh, with, of course, the caveat that chapters two and eight are going to be, with all their subsections, are going to be quite large. Um, and that's where we explore decision spaces. Um, so that's I guess a quick thought about the overall the, the the balance of content among chapters. I don't have a I don't want to misspeak about the targets for the total length. Heen, I don't know if you've got that at the tip of your tongue. Hi everybody. Um, so it can look daunting the thousand plus pages in the first draft. I would like to ensure everybody that um, coming from IFES, working in the first work program for almost a decade, uh, and working mainly with assessments. Um, we always emphasize scientific knowledge rigor 
and evidence base being thoroughly examined. So in that sense, um, we will be moving a lot of the material that you see now into supplementary material, but this is to show the committee that the work is being done. Um, and it's based on either semi-systematic or systematic or inductive ways of reviewing um, the material. So we expect the final laid out uh, technical report of all of the chapters to be approximately 700, 800 pages with a supplementary material that a lot of the material that you're reading now will be moved into, and it's just a synthesis within the chapters. Now, the summary for decision makers is generally the one that's widely disseminated, and uh, I would estimate something around 50,000 words. Because we're working with three different countries, um, that will be very succinct, and they will have sections um, that are pertinent to each country, because each country has their own set of laws, or policies, regulations, and then there will be obviously one section on the biophysical uh, findings. Um, each chapter will have a chapter executive summary, so if people do not want to read the full chapter and its supplementary material, you will also have a briefer with um, confidence terms uh, and traceability within the chapter executive summary. So what we want to do is we want to make this report extremely accessible. So the summary for decision makers will not have a lot of jargon, but you as the committee and readers will know that it's underpinned by this just rigorous work underneath. Um, so nothing is superficial, um, you know, highest quality of science is trying to be conducted within the assessment. Again, supplementary material will be divided in the next external review, and then you'll start to see more of the core chapter drafts uh, in March of 2025. Thank you. Danya? Yeah, well, you looked like you were about to push the button. Sorry? Yeah, sure, of course. Please ask whatever you want to ask. Hi, I have a follow-up question to that. Um, so how do you make the decision what goes into supplementary material versus what's kept in the chapter? I think as it stands now in chapters that I've read, I don't think I could make that dis distinction. I'll let John and or Stephanie, who is the other co-chair, or anybody else jump in. But in my mind, for example, you could imagine a chapter has a rich array of case studies that show local, um, maybe local examples of implementing policy or regulation that has worked or has not worked. So let's say your chapter has um, 25 case studies. But from these case studies, you can glean some commonalities, maybe some, some, some areas that aren't common. Maybe the key message is it's contextual. But so it's a summary of all of those case studies. The case studies would go in the supplementary material and you would be taking away the key messages, common or not, from those case studies into the main chapter material. Um, it is. It will be a challenge. I'm not saying it's not Daniel, to, to de decipher what goes in supplementary material or not, but it's really synthetic in the chapter. That's what we're pushing for, as opposed to a lot of the contextual and, and unpacking in the supplementary material. Uh, yeah, Christina has a question. Yes, um, kudos to you for prioritizing uh, scientific rigor. Uh, can you please describe how indigenous knowledge will uh, also be prioritized and I've noted that you cite the guidance uh, of, created by the White House uh, CEQ for working with indigenous knowledge and tribal nations. And there have been multiple other uh, policies and guidance documents that have been uh, published by the White House um, and the president and the joint secretarial orders about working with indigenous knowledge and centering it. So uh, can you please describe how that 
is being prioritized. And then when you separate out some of the detailed Western science, um, how are you managing the indigenous knowledge as well? I wish that Kyle White were here. He was, he is, um, we elevated him to ask him to to take a role as a as a co-chair and he took that on. Um, I'll take a quick stab at it and then see if if anyone has any any additional information. I mean, one of the things we've really tried to do is to have indigenous authors that bring you know, sort of help us make these connections in I think we've got them in almost every chapter. So we've tried to to seed, you know, seed that that expertise throughout the assessment. That's one of the strategies we've strategies we've tried to take. The other thing we've tried to do is be explicit about the value of having indigenous knowledges and indigenous perspectives, not only in sort of the, the synthesis of the state of knowledge, but also in other parts of the, of the assessment, for example, in testimonials. So we're going to have, uh, I, I don't know exactly how many at this point, but I think several testimonials from indigenous um, perspectives and, and, and knowledge holders. I don't know. That's a that's a couple of thoughts, and then we have, and I don't, I don't, I don't know, Hina, if we're if we're if the sort of guidance that the Indigenous Knowledge Caucus came up with is something we can share or or where that stands, but but they self organized in our in our in person meeting and developed some guidance for sort of how to do this, and I don't want to misspeak and mischaracterize it, or and I'm not sure if we're allowed to, <laughs> not sure what the state of that is, but but from their perspective, sort of how this should be done appropriately was something that we spent quite a bit of time trying to think through. And we've shared that with all the authors. So, um, you know, our hope is that, that and our belief is that all the authors are taking that charge pretty seriously. Yep. So just to add on top of what John said, uh, we took inspiration from the IPBAS process um, into this um, assessment. So IPBAS has worked on an approved uh, indigenous knowledge approach that was a uh, uh, discussed amongst governments, member countries uh, of IPBES, and that was approved in 2015. So in taking inspiration from that, we are also looking at their approach, in addition to the White House memo that was uh, mentioned, and the Department of Interior has a new policy that was released on Indigenous knowledges, and then a implementation guidebook that we are also made very aware of. Um, so we're working with all of these uh, to ensure that um, the U.S. and Mexico and Canada are um, applying, elevating uh, um, Indigenous knowledges across all of the chapters. This document that was meant to be a guidance called the Indigenous Knowledges Guidance Document that was again, um, initiated by the Indigenous scholars within our authorship group, will be released in 2025 as supplementary material to the 100% chapter draft in the public review. Right now, it's being developed. Um, there's still a lot of discussion, but to ensure that people are acknowledging Indigenous knowledge and different, um, uh, different knowledge systems, and Indigenous scholars like John said, are across almost all of our chapters as well. So we're trying our best. Obviously, they're Thank you not perfect, that. but yeah. Thank you for that. And Kyle White is um, somebody I hold in very high regard as an Indigenous scholar. And with his leadership, I know that um, this is all in very good hands. I want to follow up with another uh, with a process question. So um, you, you gave us a timeline that was very useful. So how much do you expect the report to change? You mentioned a lot of um, modifications with putting some of the material into supplemental and having key messages and having the summary for um, decision makers. How much do you expect the report to be different, your 100% draft from what we have now? And how can our comments on the draft that we have now be useful in your process if the if the hundred percent draft in March will be substantially different? How are you thinking about that? I think one of the biggest changes that we all hope for between the current draft and the final draft is you know approachability. <laughs> so, 
the the final draft the the chapter content themselves will be much more uh, synthetic to the point um and, and a lot of the sort of supporting material will be in the supplementary materials in terms of the ways that this committee can be useful uh in my mind there's at least a, a few things um that I, I tried to mention before but i think it's worth dwelling on them a little bit one is you know i, I don't i hope that there aren't very many important points that we make in the final report that are not in the current draft. But if there are some that we're missing, this committee might be, you know, one of the great groups to help us find those. Are we, is there something important that we have not yet captured? Um, and that, obviously that would be something that would be different uh, and we'd be grateful for that insights. It's also worth noting that in the, in the charge of transparency, is there something that we are overstating the evidence for? Um, so have we missed anything? Have we overstated anything? And then maybe the third thing on my mind is just to recognize that this is the first attempt at an assessment like this for this region. Um, and and maybe it's also the first that's trying to push the envelope to get to get relevant down that decision space into the practitioner realm. And so are there thoughts from the committee about how future assessments could be more effective? And you know those will benefit us to the extent that we'll have time to leverage them, but I think they'll still be beneficial in the broader, longer context of these type of assessments going forward. I don't know. That's my initial response. Open up to anybody else involved to provide their perspectives. Fernando. Yes, thank you. I I fully agree with the concept of a uh, kind of nested uh, nested report, where um, there is an, a segment of the central segment of the report, and we should be uh, communicated to um, to everybody, you know, not just uh, decision makers. And uh, the litmus test there should be to take. Uh, uh, a small group of uh, uh, motivated, interested human beings, um, educated but not specialized, and uh, see whether they react to to the proposal of the of the nucleus as something understandable and making sense to them, and and filter the rest to um, to specialized language where. Uh, we, we could be more at ease. Currently, the report, um, I think, mixes languages. Some are understandable by everybody. Others, uh, now, you, you have to be a specialized uh, agent to, to recognize some, uh, some process or some uh, ideas. So let's, let's move on along those lines. I think it makes sense. I think that's a, from my perspective, that's a, a fantastic point. And that's some of what I believe we're really going to be struggling with in our in-person meeting when we try to think about the summary for decision makers is, you know, I I, I think it actually, I think Steve, it was you that, that <laughs> said once that in our, in our, when we think of decision makers, we also think of the public as in there somewhere. Um, and so we're going to, at least my hope is that we will try to craft that summary for decision makers to be something that is understandable and at some level relevant to an engaged, relatively educated member of the public. And that's that's gonna be a, a challenge, but one worth at least trying to struggle with. Ruth, I don't know if you can see that the Zoom- Yeah, yeah I was just meeting. gonna call on Gerardo and then uh, Rudolfo, who is both are online. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you for uh, your time and explain us about this has been very useful. Uh, I have a, a two, two more general questions and one specific question. I will start for the one more specific. Uh, we were discussing what will be the most useful, most, most helpful uh, uh, of our review for you. For example, we may have comments on the structure, topics, or context messages on the one hand, some more general things, but also we, may most likely have a, a also a comments on missing literature, some topics, uh, some graphs, some figures, et cetera. So, so we were wondering what at this stage, what will be more useful for you? 
uh, in terms of, uh, of our review and also in terms of the short time that we have and the short time that you will have to. And then the, sec the second part is, uh, I was uh, reading chapter three and uh, the introduction and so on, and it wa I was uh, kind of perplexed that uh, I couldn't find in the in the in the whole uh, 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 assessment, but I may have missed it that there is no a, a mention of the real of the value of uh, biodiversity for climate change. It, it has been explicitly mentioned the impacts of climate change on biodiversity, but not the other way around. And I think that is very critical for an assessment like that, for instance, you know? And the other part that I was uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, interesting when reading chapter three, and I think this will be important to, to be very careful, is that, um, uh, for instance, in the uh, at the end of the, the, the chapter three, it doesn't seem to be that there is an agreement on most of these issues that there is an impact of climate change. And uh, that worries me a little bit because if that's the way it goes to the public, to the policy makers, it would seem that we don't have an agreement that is a big impact of climate change on these issues. I'll start with, I think, your first question, which was sort of what kind of input would be most useful? And I think you characterized it in, in terms of potential suggestions for modified structure, which are kind of high level versus potential suggestions for modified detailed content yeah. figures. Um, I mean, is it is it acceptable to say that we'd like all that feedback and then we will try to ingest as much as we possibly can? I don't, I can't, I won't make any promises about our ability to dramatically change the structure at that late date. There'll, there'll certainly be some limitations to that. We can't at that point add chapters. Um, but we can at least be aware of what structural changes um, might be beneficial and anything we can do, we'll, we'll, we'll take to heart. In terms of the detailed commentary on like, where are we missing literature or where might a particular figure be very illustrative for making a point? That, that I think will be very much something that we can still integrate at that, at that time. So yeah, that's a quick perspective on that. In terms of the question of not just climate change impacting biodiversity, but also biodiversity being influential on climate change, both, and I think of that both in terms of climate change being uh, a, a resource and a, or biodiversity being a resource and a tool for adapting to climate change and for potentially for mitigating climate change, some of the nature-based solutions. You know, that is, um, we're hoping that that's, that's explored at least to some degree in chapter six, I think it is, the interactions among climate mitigation, adaptation, and biodiversity conservation. So recognizing that we want to, um, we, we don't want to down uh, downsell or, or underestimate the value of biodiversity for providing solutions to climate change, both mitigation and adaptation. So I don't know that that, I don't know if you looked at chapter three, it probably wouldn't be in chapter three, but I think it'll be in other chapters. I don't know if he has got anything to expand on that. Hopefully that helps. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, John and, and him for um, uh, introducing uh, and this um, <clears throat> uh, comments uh, prefacing our conversation today. That was really very useful also. And um, I have to confess that uh, when I read the, the six chapters that I was assigned to read, I was not aware of the plans for the integrity across the chapters that you have discussed and presented to us. I am excited to hear about this idea that you have about the thematic arcs, which sounds terrific. And I felt that that was a big miss, but I'm glad to hear that you are contemplating, contemplating that challenging thing, because I don't think it's going to be um, very easy. I think it's going to be a big challenge, but I'm so glad to hear that that is in the works. Um, also very happy to hear about the indigenous peoples, uh, cocos. I think that's, that's an incredibly valuable um, uh, move to to include for the uh, as a, as a way of informing the the assessment, um, and I'm so happy also to hear that you have involved uh, Professor Kai White for the reasons that Christina commented in her uh, intervention. Um, <clears throat> you invited us, John and Hien, to to mention what we think that is underemphasized or perhaps underrepresented, and Gerardo alluded to the question of the. Of the change of the impacts of biodiversity on the climate being being one that we felt and certainly I felt in the chapters I read to be missing, 
Um, but I wanted to I wanted to ask if if there's an, any chance to consider the possibility that th there are these two drivers that that in, uh, they don't, do not operate in isolation, but they actually operate in synergies, which makes the modeling and everything very complicated. But unfortunately for us human beings, all the drivers of change are also involved in that. Imagine the situation of climate affecting invasive species that affecting biodiversity and vice versa. So the feedbacks that you would have there are really very, very complex. And I totally understand the science is not well advanced in those multiple synergies, direct and indirect effects and so on. But at least recognizing that those things are really there and very challenging for what we need to do about this crisis that we have of those two phenomena. And the last thing, if I may, uh, um, something that, I, that, I've, that I've thought in my reflection of reading your chapters would be uh, interesting, if, if at all possible, to, to bring uh, into the, into, to the table in this, in this assessment, which is the fact that um, you know, North America, as, as defined, even if it's just uh, geopolitically defined, which is not a natural definition, um, is really quite significant, globally speaking. I mean, we're talking about collectively almost 16 million uh, square kilometers, which is a gigantic area of the planet, a, pro a significant proportion of the planet. In that area, we have from, you know, very dry, dry deserts, like in the Sonoran Desert, to the tropical rainforest of southeast Mexico, right? Places with almost no precipitation per year to almost five meters of precipitation, an incredible diversity of climates and ecosystems and so on. Um, and we have, you know, connections that bring about invasive species, zoonotic species, and so on and so forth. Would it be all of that is to preface the following question? Would it be possible or would it be unthinkable to bring into the assessment the um, the assessment of biodiversity and climate change in North America in the global context because of the influences of North America on the on the other parts of the planet and vice versa? I know it's a challenging thing, but I, I think it's such an important thing that I don't know whether you might want to contemplate that. And thank you for your attention. I love that question. Um... I wish I had a satisfactory answer that that we were going to try to do that, but I think at this point we're 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 mostly staying constrained within um, within sort of the North American domain. Um, I don't know, Heen, you might have a better ability to speak to if there's been other work that has really tried to consider North America in the global context. Yeah, so um, it it is a really good question. Uh, if you're interested, I know you've been assigned a certain chapter, but uh, please look at chapter seven. The original, I think, title was um, Biodiversity in a Regional and Global Context, something along those lines. But they look at telecoupling or flows, as they'll call it. And so it's impacting, you know, things that happen in one area, impacting, obviously, things in another area and not taking into account geopolitical borders. And I think that they do talk a little bit about the global context there. If you have additional suggestions for them, uh, areas of high vulnerability or um, urgency, I, I think they would appreciate that uh, feedback uh, quite a bit in Chapter 7. And I see that our co-chair has, our co-chair, um, uh, our other one has her hand up. So I'll turn off my mic at this point. No, thank you, everyone. Um, sorry about the cord. I agree with everything that was said. And I just thought I would point out this doesn't satisfy your excellent question for now in this assessment, but as was in the in the in, in John's presentation, this is also going to be fed into the <clears throat> IPES Intergovernmental Platform Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services into that processes for the second global assessment. So it doesn't quite get to what you're talking about here and now in this text, but it will be pushed forward and certainly hopefully picked up uh, by the experts and authors who work to pull that together once that process is started. But in the spirit of, of uh, being uh, to the extent possible helpful to you, he had mentioned that if there's if there's any suggestion, the case of uh, zoonotic diseases and pandemics is a wonderful example that could be used perhaps as a box or something to illustrate these global connections, changes in biodiversity, uh, release of some uh, species that are uh, hosts of pathogens, movement of humans and so on. That is kind of a, a connection between North America and sort of the global in terms of finding specific examples that might illustrate those issues. 
Thank you. Thank you. That's definitely helpful feedback. Yeah, thank you. I just want to acknowledge the awkwardness of this format. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like we're just lobbing questions at you and then seeing you on a big screen, but we're um, we're trying to make this as much of a conversation as as we can. <laughs> and also to acknowledge um, the chats that people are um, putting in. So thanks for that. That's good. We'll we'll try to, we'll make sure to save the chats. Um, John. Um, thanks. Uh, and thanks, thanks, um, John and and all. Um, I think these comments have just been um, really useful at sort of fleshing out some of the some of the initial questions that we had. And I think my comments sort of pick up a little bit on the last um, comments from Rodolfo and Gerardo and Fernando. Um, um, they they sort of touch on sort of knitting together these things. But I would I would start by saying that um, I read chapter seven um, in detail. Um, I can see um, in the um, placeholders um, the the interest in kind of reaching out to to the international set of examples, and I think there really is some opportunities there um, in in what is already happening in in Chapter Seven. So I would certainly certainly encourage that. Um, um, in terms of um, knitting together um, the uh, the the two the complexity of climate change and biodiversity loss. Um, um, I I was really impressed by um, the the efforts that individual chapters made to to get on top of those those issues. And what what was clear is that each chapter often had a somewhat separate. A conceptual framework to get at that issue. It sort of reminds me of the elephant and the, the individuals reaching out to the elephant and trying to trying to capture the complexity of that interaction. Um, uh, I think my question relates to: Is there an opportunity, uh, as you see it, to um, integrate those different conceptual frameworks? Um, some of those conceptual frameworks are quite explicit, like in like in chapter one and chapter seven. Some of them are more um, implicit, uh, like in chapter five and six, which does look at the impact of biodiversity loss on climate. Um, but there, but there isn't as clear a conceptual framework linking them, and and. Um, I think it might be very useful if it is possible to develop that that um, integrated conceptual framework that pulls together the different frameworks which are um, already present in the in the various chapters. So I'd be very interested here if you see there's a real opportunity to do that. Well, I don't know. I'm an ecosystem ecologist, so I love conceptual frameworks and, and boxes and arrow diagrams. Um, I don't know, Steve, you want to share the, your thoughts on you, in your chapter one? I think you're going to have a diagram that, that tries to pull together some of the connections among all the chapters and this broader conceptual, what we might think of as a conceptual framework for interactions among all these all these processes. Yeah, that uh, there there is uh, actually I think three three diagrams that uh, that uh, show the relationships among the various uh, entities. We it, it builds on the IPIS conceptual framework and then uh, unpacks some of the specifics that this uh, assessment will be uh, will be getting at. Um, but uh, that was that was intended as an overarching framework for the entire report and for all of the chapters. So those will be useful in. Um, in identifying uh, where uh, what the ch different chapters cover and how they relate to each other, that might uh, for for people who are who are dealing with the more detailed chapters, uh, ch chapter one might be useful to at least take a skim of or to to have a look at um, at the couple of pages of text that describes each of the chapters uh, because it'll give you an idea of. Uh, the content of each of the chapters and and maybe allay some of the uh, the confusion uh, in questions around that. Um, 
Yeah, we we didn't, uh, or I, I I don't think there was uh, there was a design to uh, impose specific conceptual structures within each of the chapters. Uh, uh, the the diagram and diagrams in chapter one are really intended uh, to draw all of the chapters together in relationship to each other. And it sounds like what you're pointing out, John, is that uh, there's a lot of diversity among chapters in how they are structuring their particular content. And uh, yeah, I agree that would I, I that, that would be a good thing to to look at and see if we can find some uh, some ways to um, provide more uniformity and consistency uh, in the in the next uh, revision. And I think comments like that would be really valuable from the um, from the committee. So just sort of a quick follow up to that. Um, you know, what was what was quite clear in chapter one and seven is that the um, the core structure relates to how does climate change affect uh, various things which affect biodiversity. And in chapter um, five and six, it was looking at how biodiversity affects climate change. And so pulling those all together might be very useful. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great, I think that's a great suggestion. I agree. Yeah, hi, this is Pam. Hey, John, good to see you. Um, so you guys have a, a slightly unusual um, structure in that you have six co-chairs, which I'm very envious of. So you can share the, <laughs> share the duties a little bit. And I wonder if you could talk us through a little bit of how you see um, each of your roles. And I'm just thinking like, are you dividing up, you know, certain co-chairs are sort of focused on one or two chapters? Are you sort of dividing up in terms of content? You know, we heard about um, uh, Dr. Kyle White is, is really um, helping focus on indigenous knowledge across all the chapters. Um, in terms of, you know, assessments have different you know, ways of going, as you know, right? Some are very sort of self-contained in chapters. And so the, the co-chairs are kind of providing overall guidance and others like co-chairs are, you know, really in there and shaping the material and so forth. So, you know, what do you, what do you see um, the co-chairs doing in the next, you know, however months you have left, um, 16 months or so? Um, and are there particular things that this committee could recommend um, that would help you with with thinking through what you think that role should be in particular for co-chairs and then your relationship with the, the CLAs and the chapters. Um, and as a sort of corollary to that, um, part of this is gonna be also putting all that together in the, the summary for decision makers. Um, so if you have, so kind of helping us think through like what's that process gonna be to get the um, SPM done um, and how it relates to chapter nine, because you've got a synthesis at the end as well. So this is all kind of process questions, but I think it would help us help you to kind of think how you're thinking through those things. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, I'll take a quick crack at it and then see if others want to expand as well. So one thing we thought about in sort of the co-chairs is try to have a diversity of geographies and national representation and diversity of, of sort of background topical expertise. So we have marine folks, terrestrial folks, um, that kind of, of of broad perspective, which allows us to lean on each other when we need we need more more expertise and context. Um, in terms of how we are approaching, you know, for example, right now the specific task of of providing input on this this first order draft, um, we have divided up the assessment and assigned each co chair to I think roughly about forty percent of it, so that we've got overlapping. Um, overlapping chapters, and we're going to try to provide detailed detailed input on that section for each of us, um, and and then skim the rest of it to to help ensure consistency. Uh, that's that's my initial thoughts on sort of the co-chair approach to how we're making this work. Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, I'm the only well, Stephanie's here is with us today. I'm doing most of the talking, but you know, it's really been a team effort. So um, I feel a little bad trying to being the only <laughs> only representative here today. Uh, but it's it's um, I think it's worked out pretty well. I think uh, perspectives and suggestions from other folks that have more deep experience with assessments would be welcome. Uh, in terms of your question about the how we're going to approach the summary for decision makers, um, 
I don't have a super clear vision at this point, except that we've got a whole in-person meeting just for that. And so we're going to probably get a lot more specific about how we're going to tackle that as that meeting approaches. Um, I don't know, Stephanie, you want to want to chime in on any of this? Sure. I mean, I, from the working backwards a little bit from the summary for decision makers piece, I think that uh, some of that will be for trying to further condense, you know, really paraphrase each of the uh, each of the chapters. Uh, the chapter nine is more of a, or I think will be more of a, here's what we're looking at. Here's what we've learned. Here's sort of where can we go? What can we do with some of this? Whereas a uh, summary for decision makers will be more of a short version that they pick up to really read or keep on their desk or actually absorb more and then look back to the longer document for more of the more fulsome details. Um, and that is something we're starting to think about now as we all read through uh, this first draft and, and identifying some key themes that we're seeing in each of the chapters that we'll want to make sure are very clearly put forward. Um, in my mind, again, kind of looking at the IPAS models, if you've seen some of the summary for policymakers, uh, that's at least what I'm thinking of as, as a first example that could be useful for us to, to consider as a, as a tool um, or as a model. Um, I think that, that John, you kind of described the co-chairs values and perspectives and, and kind of each, each, um, skills that we each bring to the table very well, um, regional, uh, different kind of from a federal government perspective, from a picking a how does one uh, hopefully create knowledge and create recommendations that can be usable and, and actually inform decision making, um, each bring those perspectives and then we all uh, work together and also pay attention to the pieces that then the context in which we most closely work. I'm a trained as an evolutionary biologist who's been doing government, international, environmental negotiations and government work for my most of my adult life. Uh, so I am looking less closely at the three through seven, for example, and more at the two and eight pieces, and in particular, some of the transboundary and international components. At just as, as an example of my kind of personal, where I see I add uh, more value and where I don't have that much to add. Um, just to add on to what Stephanie and John has said, um, in chapter nine, they're able to unpack a little bit uh, that hasn't been unpacked in the rest of the chapters that you would not see in a summary for decision makers. So they have a section in there about transformative change. Um, and Pam, your question is um, unique because you're coming from a perspective of where you're a co-chair and your co-chairship got reduced. So I think that actually when you're looking at advice or comments from the committee, uh, to the co-chairs, especially in the development of summary for decision makers, things that they can focus on um, because you're going through the motions now through your experience actually would be quite helpful. We are following the it best model, even though there's no approval process for member countries. Um, but, you know, we want it to be policy relevant, laying out the options in a readable way that makes sense, that people can just pick certain parts that are relevant to them. and and just echoing what others have said, it should be usable and useful to a wider readership than just Congress. So, Yeah, thanks. I had a um, comment about the this process of getting to a summary for decision makers, which is, as you all said, um, is the most important part of the whole assessment. Um, so we're, you know, us academics, we love things like interactions and synergies and complexity and transformation and all these kinds of things. The practitioners and the policy people, they relate to things like, just I'm not one of them, but I can imagine, they relate to things like 
disease, invasives, wildlife, uh, fisheries, equity. I mean, the issues that they're dealing with. So do you see that the summary for decision makers could somehow cut across the chapters and pull out um, the key points in ways that are, um, you know, might not necessarily be chapter by chapter, but that would really address the um, the issues, which is basically resource management, that um, that the practitioners are, that's their mandate to manage them. Would I that work? That's a, that's... Way of thinking or would that, it sounds hard, but uh, just wondering what your thoughts are about how you go from what there is to the summary for decision makers. Yeah, from, from my perspective, what, what you described with is, I think, exactly what we're trying to do, which is, you know, we it's if you notice, it's not a summary for policymakers, it's a summary for decision makers, because we're hoping to have, you know, nuggets of hopefully useful information for folks that are not necessarily setting policy for an agency or Congress, but actually making a decision on, you know, summit level on the ground. Um, and I guess the way that, that, that I, to the extent that I have, uh, you know, coherent visions of how that comes to be. It starts with a list of key take-home messages from each chapter that could be at different levels with different relevance for folks across that decision-making spectrum. Um, and then we synthesize those together, try to find commonalities and themes and organize them into an approachable narrative that becomes the summary for decision-makers that doesn't, you know, it's not going to be chapter by chapter. It's going to be, I hope, more sort of theme by theme. Um, and And again, we're hoping that it has some some nuggets of relevance for folks further down that decision making structure. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's, 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 I was thinking about that in terms of of Pam's question of how do we how do we approach it, um, and that distinction between policymakers and decision makers is one of the one of the salient nuggets in my mind for for how for the depth of which we're hoping to go into that a little bit. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jen. Jen, and then Karen. <laughs> um, again. Thinking about when we're looking at this and reviewing it, how do you envision that uh, chapters two and chapters eight would be used? Because so they're broken up into sections by Canada, US, Mexico, international. Would the goal be that someone looking at this, for example, in chapter two, would be able to say, oh, okay, how do the policies differ between Canada and the US? How do they differ with Mexico? And, and be able to really compare across those and then go to chapter eight and say, okay, I've, I've learned about them in chapter two. Now what's the future and how does that compare between them? And have you thought about how the structures might need to be adjusted so that that is more possible if, if that is the goal you're looking for? Um, from my perspective, I guess, I, I can imagine there's real value in contrasting, say, the, the different country-specific sections of chapters two and eight. I also see value in, in, in a, a reader who might focus on just the Canadian section in two and then the Canadian section in eight. Um, I think there's a lot, there could be a lot to be learned about how a different country approaches a challenge in a different way that highlights benefits that might be highlight that might be expressly called out in chapter eight. Look, you know, some country does it in a different way and that seems to be working more effectively. That might be a path forward, an opportunity that we could identify in chapter eight. Um, I don't I, I don't have a good answer at the moment for how we how we might restructure that to enable that more effectively. We have tried to promote connections among each of the uh, chapters two subsections and chapters eight subsections. So what I think of as sort of lateral connections, as well as what I think of as the vertical connections between 2A and 8A and 2B and 8B. So all those connections have been made. Those those authors are talking to each other. Um, and beyond that, I'm, you know, I don't think we have a specific structure. But if you've got suggestions for ways to enable that communication or ways to... And one thing we've struggled with, for example, is should we have consistent... In, you know, internal structure of the chapter of the subchapters be consistent between 8A and 8B and 8C, um, or do we allow the different countries to do it their own way? And I don't think we've reached a final resolution on that. We need to have them have similar flavors, but I don't know if we have to have them be exactly the same. But if the committee has suggestions about a, a, an effective way to approach that, I think we would welcome it. I don't know if anybody else has got any any responses. Yeah, um, Stephanie, did you, your hands up, did you have a point on the, this discussion? 
Yeah, no, I'll chime in on that to add to that because um, we have talked about it and, and we also really recognize, um, yes, there is validity um, in many places from kind of an, an interest perspective that Canada, the United States and Mexico are all grappling with these issues um, in different ways and have, have you know, to, to put it plainly, have different government systems and, and different ways of, of dealing with their citizens and their international commitments or not uh, that that impacts all of that and because we want this to also be going back to the, the the one of the main goals of having this be useful to decision makers um we went round and round a little bit as amongst the co-chairs and and even amongst the authors but we want the authors and the practitioners to write what is also helpful for them and what is helpful for the decision makers in their countries. So some of this context in two and eight is, well, hopefully it is, as John put it, the flavor is consistent and helpful and not too jarring to a reader that might be looking across the whole piece rather than a decision maker in any of the three respective countries picking up those particular components and thinking, oh, wait, this is what's helpful for me. The transboundary piece in, in 8D, um, then hopefully we'll take that a little bit of a step further, kind of understanding a little bit of the groundwork of the overview and then thinking, all right, if this species is crossing their territory crosses these three countries what does that look like what what do we know and how are the different components wildlife management policies and regulations how does that that interact together i hope that's helpful and and if and if it is this is not working as you read it that's also really helpful feedback for us thank you we have hands from karen Peter, you had your hand up? No, Peter? Okay, Karen and Christina. And yeah, my, yeah, yeah, my question may have just sort of been answered in that quite a bit of, of discussion. So, uh, but it was, it was sort of triggered by the discussion coming out of chapter nine, the synthesis, um, but it, I think it got even greater detail there in the two eight combination. But, but anyway, it was, it was broadly about that decision maker, policy maker, and and thinking about, you know, you've got not just each individual country and potential policy relevant recommendations or, or input there, but you also have the bilats and then a, a multilat as well. And, you know, again, thinking to some of the chapters I read, um, it, 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 I suppose it would be really important to make sure that not just chapters two and eight really kind of identified some of this, but some of the other ones as well. So um, I'll just put that out there. So thank you. Yeah, that's a great point. Taking a note here. Uh, my question uh, is about data. Um, is there a plan to make rep recommendations about data governance? And I would like to give you some context for this question. Um, I am one of the people who, this is a very pressing topic for federal leaders um, regarding natural resources in the U.S. Um, and also in Canada. In the U.S., I am leading for the Department of Agriculture tribal roundtables, which are talking circles eco-regionally to talk about um, data sovereignty. It, that's what's coming up regarding the National Old Growth Amendment and other policy shifts coming that have to do with addressing climate change. And so these talking circles have had over a hundred tribes at them, their leadership and data sovereignty comes up as one of the top three topics that they bring up. So one way to put this is I was at the Intertribal Timber Council meeting a couple of years ago and they said, great, the world is coming to an end, one person said, and now they want our knowledge. 
So um, that was a, a crowd of mostly indigenous leaders in the US, but this is a concern is, you know, how do these partnerships look and how is indigenous, um, what's the plan for working with indigenous knowledge as data? Yeah, it's a it's a great point, and I know that that data sovereignty, and particularly tribal data sovereignty, has came up came up quite clearly in our in person meeting, and our Indigenous Caucus is 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 considering that in their in their guidance document. Um, I'm not sure at the moment if how much we're gonna we're gonna come out with any specific recommendations or 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 policies on that. I don't know, Heen, if you've got a perspective on on uh, on how it's going to be handled, but but sort of appropriate ways to to treat and include or not or integrate or not or weave or not indigenous knowledges and indigenous data um, is something that 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 guidance document is at least touching on. Uh, my recommendation would be um, what I've seen you know federal leaders moving towards is a statement that says we will honor and respect tribal data, indigenous data sovereignty based on the policies of each um, country. And because it's evolving rapidly what data sovereignty means. And so that is an expression of, we recommend that this be observed, you know, the specifics will depend on how some of these policies are evolving. Yeah, that's a, that's a great suggestion. And one I think is completely consistent with what we've been talking about so far. Stephanie, do you want to say something? I just would like to say, you know, uh, Kyle White will also be paying a lot of great attention to these uh, topics. And then uh, we would adhere to FAIR principles for data and information management and some care principles. So in 8B, they have started to write some uh, text about care principles. Oh. I don't think I have too much more to add that hasn't been said. It is certainly something that we are um, sensitive to and very aware of. And the Indigenous Caucus um, was very clear in wanting to make sure that authors uh, were aware of this, were being thoughtful of this, and that you know, this is entirely voluntary and um, we recognize that we, that, that knowledge, indigenous knowledge is not something that we have a right to have. We don't even necessarily, we don't even have a right to ask for it. Um, and that we need to be very in tune um, and thoughtful about how we are handling any, any knowledge that is um, shared with us and, and to make sure that 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 knowledge is being shared appropriately and and by the correct holder of the knowledge who has that right to do so. Um, so we're still really grappling with it, uh, but but trying to um, be be as be thoughtful and and follow uh, best practices. Danielle, did you have a comment on this point or a different point? Okay, then we'll go Fernando and then Danielle. Well, thank you. I'm I'm addressing the the broadest um, possible scope of our discussions, and I I wouldn't call them um, conceptual, but rather mindsets. Like what? And the UN um, spoke at the beginning of uh, the period, the Guterres period, uh, about uh, climate change being the, the biggest challenge of uh, the, the 21st century. But then I think he realized that uh, biodiversity was already on, on, on the menu. And he started uh, talking about uh, making peace with nature, not just the atmosphere, but nature in general. And OK, what, what kind of war are we, <laughs> are we staging with nature? And, how, how could we even think the problems as a war with nature? Another, a, a, another issue of the same level, are we witnessing a, a sixth mass extinction or not? Um, okay, um, 
it has to do also with our concept of Anthropocene. And uh, we, we know that the geologists rejected this as a, as a geology uh, concept. But anyway, the, everybody agrees that it's a useful concept. And what kind of, of, uh, of uh, concept is the Anthropocene? And then my final point would be something that I thought it was settled long ago. But uh, apparently, mm, watching the discussions of the very recent years, is climate change an anthropogenic problem? There are now uh, new variants of denialism that uh, say that uh, the, it's not uh, the concentration of greenhouse gases that causes uh, the elevation of temperature, but the other way around. It's the elevation of temperatures that causes concentrations. It changes completely the policy. Well, it's we, we always witnessed uh, freaks and um, silly positions, but uh, in this case, I'm, I'm really worried because this uh, idea, this concept has been published by, by all means, the Royal Society. That's, that's unbelievable, outrageous, but it's there. So on the one hand, I think that these discussions may facilitate communication between us and with the public. On the other hand, if we think that they, these discussions would be not that productive and rather contentious, we may set aside this discussion and go along with, with the business as usual, and that's it. I, I would be happy with both ways, but um, is there any, any, any policy from the academies or from the geological survey um, drawing the, the, the border lines of, the, of our discussions? Yeah, that's a, a good question. And certainly I you know, personally share your, your concerns and frustration. If memory serves, we discussed some of these broader context defining issues early on in the in the BCCA discussion and and, and structuring of what we were going to cover. And we we don't intend to try to tackle the question of of the origins of climate change or the causes. Uh, we're going to leave that to things like IPCC reports. And and our our launching point is climate is changing and biodiversity is being impacted and, and biodiversity patterns are impacting our ability to mitigate or adapt to climate change. And those sort of those interactions are where we're st setting forth just because I think we have more, <laughs> we have more than we can handle within that con confine, uh, much less trying to take on the, the, the broader topics. Um, I know that's, that's my memory and my perspective. I don't know, Stephanie, Heen, if you want to add to that. No, I think that you're exactly right. Um, you know, this is supposed to be sort of a, a use what we have, um, look at the information that is out there, recognize the places where, if it, as appropriate, where there might not be consensus and clarity, and then uh, try to present that information to say, Here's where there might be gaps in knowledge. There might be gaps in decision making, um, and 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 hopefully provide examples and opportunities uh, where decision makers can use use the assessment to 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 act in the now. Um, so this is not going to be the place where we definitively weigh in on some of the points that you've raised and discussed as as um as really important as they are um this isn't going to be the document that that goes down that path yeah i just want to say that the diagram that you showed john about the the venn diagram with the national nature assessment and the nat um, national climate assessment and the where the, this assessment fits in was very, very clarifying. That's just a U.S. view, but um, 
But if that can somehow, that was very clarifying for me. I don't know about everybody else. Um, Danielle and then Rudolfo. Yeah, just to follow up on that comment, I'm a chapter lead for the National Nature Assessment. So actually that was super helpful to me too. So I, I completely agree with that. Um, just how, how we can interrelate and how you're going to serve as a technical contributor or in a sense, uh, inform uh, what where we are in our nation, uh, national nature assessment. And in your, um, your slides earlier, it was also helpful to hear and see about forming an indigenous caucus or indigenous knowledge caucus. I think that's a fabulous idea. You obviously have great uh, indigenous leadership as a part of your assessment. So I, I think that's fantastic. And some of my, that my, so that was my original question was how are you going to kind of address you know, indigenous peoples or knowledge as a thread throughout, and it's but it sounds like you're in the really early stages of that. And, and you you mentioned John that uh, you weren't sure kind of where the status was at with the with the caucus and in terms of their process. And so I I can appreciate that that is uh, early days, and you will work that out. And I think related to that, um, I'm just wondering how other communities will also be a thread throughout. And what I mean by that is. Um, I mean, it could mean lots of different communities, communities of color, um, other than indigenous communities. We have rural and remote versus urban, you know, those that are most impacted by climate change and don't have access to biodiversity or, you know, access or have decision making or power and um, rights. So I'm just wondering how that, how you envision that being a thread uh, throughout the assessment. That's a great question, and this is another topic that that came up. You know, the recognition that sort of climate justice and equity is is not exclusively tribal or indigenous issues. There are other socioeconomic, um, you know, racial components to this that need to be considered. Um, I think the the biggest answer is that we're aware of that that the topic is broader than than just indigenous issues, and we're we're thinking about that and considering it. I don't have a clear vision at the moment. Maybe someone else does about you know, how we're gonna to try to weave that throughout, but I can imagine that a one or two of these cross chapter thematic arcs that, that provide some perspective on how those processes uh, unfold and how they impact people uh, would be really appropriate if we can, if we can pull them off. Um, and certainly you know, because we're aware of it, we're encouraging our authors as appropriate throughout their sections to consider the broader sort of climate environmental justice topics. Just yeah, to, I can, um, I, yeah I, I was just going to say, Steve has written about that in chapter one, so if he wanted to take the floor. Yeah, yeah, I can jump in there. And um, just based on the discussions at the uh, the, uh, the all author meeting in May, uh, that then emerged from uh, a variety of directions and a variety of perspectives. So that is one of the, the overarching themes or thematic arcs. Uh, that we identify in chapter one. I haven't uh, I haven't checked all the, the the chapters as they've developed to to see that it's everywhere. But a, a lot of the different a lot of different chapters were independently uh, working in that direction. And we want we deliberately in that text tried to cast it very broadly uh, because there are many dimensions of justice and equity. Uh, in you know you, you mentioned rural communities, uh, communities that are that are res natural resource dependent. Uh, regardless of race or ethnicity, they're all very affected, and uh, and there are there are important uh, equity and justice issues both around biodiversity policy and uh, climate uh, climate change and climate policy. So uh, again, that's something that I think when all the chapters are in, or when we've had a chance to look at all of them uh, and and compare them, uh, we can um, you know, and again, we'll appreciate. The committee is identifying opportunities for that, but I think that's where uh, going into each chapter and just seeing that they've touched on that uh, in a consistent way uh, uh, across the uh, the entire report will be valuable. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really important question. Um, Rodolfo, you've had your hand up. Thank you, Ruth. <clears throat> So, uh, John and Stephanie wanted to react to Fer Fernando's comment about those three mega gigantic issues of the sixth mass extinction, climate change uh, origins, 
and um, and the Anthropocene. I totally agree with with what you, John, and Stephanie responded about climate change. I think that's that's the wise wise way to go. In relation to the sea mass extinction, though, the reality is that um, I think there would be some room in the assessment to indicate that there is a, uh, an ongoing process uh, leading us to the sea mass extinction if we look at the appropriate metrics for it, which is the extinction of the populations, not the extinction of the species, because the extinction of species is a long, slow process and is controversial because people don't quite really see the magnitude of that, even though we do know that compared to uh, sort of a background rates of extinction, this is incredibly high, the extinction of species, but the real crisis is in the extinction of populations, and we'll be more than happy to provide some, some uh, language and text or literature for you to include, them, to include that. The other one, the Anthropocene, I was wondering if you would be interested in contemplating that, um, you know, the term Anthropocene, uh, although it has penetrated into society beyond the scientific community and so on, um, it has a connotation which I think is unfair from the point of view of uh, environmental injustice, which is that when we say Anthropocene, we tend to, or people might tend to think that it's all the humanity, right, that is contributing equally to the global environmental changes. Take the case of greenhouse emissions. The reality is that indigenous communities, rural communities, the developing South, they're contributing, contributing the least to that, and they're going to be impacted the most. And so the Anthropocene, because it does not make that kind of a distinction, I wonder if it might be pertinent for you to bring that subtle, um, well, really not so subtle, but that element to clarify the, the idea. Thank you. Yeah, a couple of quick thoughts. I mean, one, you know, regarding sort of extinction rates, you know, one of the one of the sort of bedrock principles that we're working to hold to here is that we're synthesizing sort of the state of, of evidence and knowledge in the scientific literature. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that that we can make statements about rates of extinction, you know, we're going to definitely rely on what we can from the synthesis of the of the, of the literature. Um, if you can point us in directions that might provide some perspectives and new information, that would be certainly welcomed. Yeah, um, I haven't thought about the. I don't have a, a a current answer about sort of how we deal with the Anthropocene idea. I mean, we we want to sort of we definitely want to avoid creating any antagonism for the report by putting labels on it that that. Um, that, that may or may not increase our readership and our acceptance. Um, that being said, I certainly absolutely take your point that the, the effects of climate change are not attributable equitably across individuals globally. That's, uh, you know, uh, blatantly true. Uh, how much we get into that, I don't know. Um, certainly it'll come up in some of the environmental justice because there is, uh, you know, often cases where the impacts of climate change may be influencing groups disproportionately, especially when you consider their contributions to climate change. Yeah. Um, it becomes even more imbalanced when you factor that in. So that those may come up in those places as well. Correct. Anybody else wants to wants to respond as well. Correct, John. Even if, if, the, if the term Anthropocene is going to be mentioned, even footnote with this clarification might be useful, I think. Thank you. Yeah, I have a follow-up question to that about um, what what do you think is going to be in the report? Maybe it's already there, but I didn't really see it. Um, just quantitatively, what do we know? What are the ecosystems in North America? What are the, what do we know about the trends in um, biodiversity? Just sort of basic status and trends kind of um, assessment. Yeah, that's that's going to be the kind of things that's treated in the early parts of chapters three through seven, uh, you know, three, four, five, maybe. Um, and I think I think Eduardo mentioned earlier that that you know there may be some cases where where we do the systematic review and we don't find evidence for an impact of A on B, um, and that's and so that's going to be something that that emerges I think in the sort of summary for decision makers kind of part in the high high messages we can focus on the places where there are important impacts that need to be considered. Um, I you know I don't think we're going to be able to do comprehensive ecosystem by ecosystem. Uh, you know, delineation of trends and patterns. We'll have some of that where there's clear evidence, um, but, but you know, a comprehensive, detailed, almost, and this is one of the feedbacks we got from talking to some of the practitioners that they, they of course, would appreciate if we could provide specific information down to very small geographic units. 
And that's, you know, unfortunately just beyond the scope of an assessment like this. Even though we have more depth than maybe NCA and NNA, we still can't do that level of detail, especially for the entirety of the continent. Yeah, I was saying thank you. I also want to, to, to mention that we will be happy to provide the literature for the extinction, the massive extinction race and so on. And also, you yeah, want to emphasize that in terms of this report, focusing and emphasizing at some point in a couple of paragraphs, the importance of populations and species in relation to climate change and uh, providing ecosystem services and so on, will make the, the, the whole, the whole uh, assessment much, much useful uh, for policymakers and for people to understand what is at stake. If we leave out extinctions, it may not be so bad that we are having all these impacts of climate change, but if we put in the perspective of mass extinction and so on, it really become incredibly relevant. So we will be happy to help with that if you, you think it's useful. I think it would be, would be helpful. We'll yeah, take all the help we can get. Thank you. So to the point to the point that you just raised about uh, providing detailed uh, information at, at small spatial scales, I just want to point out because I know we're not actually doing the review here that an, that, that that just consider that an absence of evidence is an evidence of absence, and so if there's not research indicating that there are no effects of climate is different than uh, than uh, if there's actually a study that showed you know no no direct effect or synergistic effect uh, et cetera so I think for, for the practitioner perspective it would be important to parse those kinds of contextual uh, issues so the report's not misused you know such that there you know there was never a study here about this so we're not going to worry about it I mean that would I would think you would think that that would be a uh, uh, poor outcome of utilizing the report uh, at the local level. Yes, absolutely. I, I completely agree with your clear distinction between um, an evidence of absence and an absence of evidence. I mean, there's um, there's going to be a lot of cases in which we don't have the necessary information to say if there's an effect of A on B. Um, and that's something we'll need to be clear about. And and I, yeah, I, I completely agree with both the philosophy of your comment and the approach of being clear about that distinction in the text. Thanks, I, I appreciate that. And I think the, I mean, the other thing to consider uh, in writing is the use of strong inference in terms of the general uh, uh, outcomes of research pointing to at least effects, whether in a positive or negative direction uh, to be considered as opposed to uh, it's not, Outcomes are uncertain because they're con because they're contextual. Uh, is different than necessarily high uncertainty of any effect. Yeah, agreed, absolutely. So, Gerardo, you still have your hand up. Is there another comment or just a raised hand from leftover raised hand? There you go. Okay, thank you. Um, we have about ten minutes left. So, any other? Comments, Peter, Christina. Okay, we'll go Christina and then Peter. Sure. And then we'll throw it back to you, John, and everyone if you want to um, ask us anything. So my comment has it's not a question. It it's comment. It's about climate justice. Um, indigenous people have uh, transgenerational trauma that was caused by genocide and being forcibly removed from our lands. Um, and this is something that is embedded in our DNA in all over the world, but certainly in the US, Mexico, and Canada. And in recent conversations with indigenous leaders, what, um, what has come up is that about climate change, so climate change gathering, is that there is climate trauma that everyone is experiencing at regardless of their background. Um, but for indigenous people, it's much more severe, and this gets to the equity issue, because what removed us from our lands and you know caused genocide is also what led to the industrial revolution 
and the industrial level pollution caused anthropogenic climate change by reliance on fossil fuels and other aspects of that. And so for indigenous people, we have our climate trauma, it, it runs, it's, it's primal, it runs back through multiple generations and it's not the same as a rural landowner who settled on, you know, the land that they've been on for, you know, maybe five generations. Um, but the connection and the damage is a lot worse. And so that's something that uh, needs to be acknowledged when working with indigenous communities throughout the world. It's global, the, this type of, this layer of climate trauma that's related to transgenerational trauma. Yeah, your point is is well expressed and well taken. We, yeah, we're we're not sure exactly how, but we're we're certainly going to incorporate those ideas in our guidance to authors uh, in terms of how they consider portraying and communicating the the indigenous perspectives on these challenges. Peter. So, uh, getting getting back to an earlier discussion. Uh, about the, uh, the the summary for decision makers, uh, and I just want to suggest that you consider the role, the the issues of including both management and policy relevant uh, information in that summary. I think policy is made at multiple levels. I know, like my wife's on, on a local you know, some local uh, planning committees in our town. They make up or develop some of the policies that are being utilized uh, in addressing sustainability and climate change uh, effects. We do the same at state and regional levels, at least in the fishery management context and marine protected area context. So I think parsing the, the, the policy relevant issues out could potentially hobble the utility of the executive summary uh, in terms of its utility at multiple levels of governance. Now, clearly you don't want to include all the detail, but I think that that the, the prescriptive uh, uh, elements of, of moving to a you know, future or new ways of doing things would be really useful uh, in that document for groups that are not going to pour through the, the, the thousand whatever pages and their appendices that are going to result at the end. Food for thought. Yeah, I personally, I completely agree, Peter. And, and that's part of what motivated us really to think explicitly about trying to be useful for decision makers at, at across that whole gradient of, of, of decision making all the way as much as we can down to folks that are at, at sort of more local levels making decisions and how we navigate the challenge of bringing actionable information to all those levels in the summary for decision makers is, is going to be a challenge. But at least we're going to struggle with it. So, six minutes left, and we've been throwing questions at you. I see a chat. Thank you. So this is more of a a request of this committee, and and I'm speaking for really my just myself as one of many lead authors for chapter 8B. Um, so just for context, I, I work in the department's policy office. Um, I do policy analysis and my staff do policy analysis and, and we advise on, on policy development um, as requested by our, our leadership. Um, so uh, for myself, um, I would love to get the committee's feedback for chapter 8B um, in terms of, you know, are we missing any big things? Are there things that we have not considered? We have placeholders, of course, um, but but we would love to, I, I would love to get that feedback. Um, does chapter 8B have a good tie-in to chapter 2B? Um, that would be that would be great to hear. Also, um, is what's presented in Chapter 8B, is that balanced? Um, and I feel like, uh, you know, for myself, that's something that 
um, I feel we've we've tried to do our best in the short amount of time we have is it's not just think about the federal level, but you know think about tribal perspectives and state and local perspectives because it's going to take all the different levels working together if we are going to try and have an impact and at the very least not keep losing uh, biodiversity. Hopefully we can increase it, but at the very least um, to, to stop the decline of biodiversity will take multi-level effort. So I would love to get um, any feedback from this group on that. Um, are, we, are we addressing the equity issue? Um, are we thinking about the balanced perspectives, not just in terms of fish, wildlife, plants, habitats, but also the human well-being aspect, um, livelihoods. Uh, you know, this, this, this assessment is um, not just geared towards one particular uh, audience. It's, it's meant hopefully to appeal or at least make everyone think about how we can work together to do something great for for North America really. And so we have to think about um, other perspectives, the economy, recreation, people's livelihoods, people in urban areas, people in suburban and rural areas. So I think uh, with that I'll I'll shut up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Patrick. Uh, yeah, great, Janet. Thanks, thanks a lot. And I've actually read two B and in eight B in detail. And um, uh, you you raised some uh, some really good issues that would make for an effective uh, assessment. That is seeing two B and eight B as uh, as a continuum as as really connected. So uh, and also a treatment at all hierarchical levels, you know, national, regional, local, and of course, tribal. Um, we can't get, we can't be very specific about our comments to you uh, because of the process, but you've named, and, and uh, but you've named, you know, two issues there, um, to which we'll be, you know, paying attention and, um, and that are really important for an effective uh, assessment. Joan. Um, um, thanks, Janet. And, and um, these are thoughts that riff off yours, which is one of the one of the real wonderful things about this assessment was that each one of these chapters, subchapters, just have a, has an amazing richness of, of themes. Um, um, and one of the one of the real challenges to someone coming in and reading it in depth quickly is how do you how do you establish the links if you will between you know the the structural connections between all the different pieces the thematic connections between all the different pieces and and just sort of a general comment um, to john um, it would be really useful to sort of step back a little bit and think what are the signposts that the reader could find so that the reader could be led through some of those structural and thematic connections. Um, uh, um, I'm not quite sure where in the document one can do it, but it would be extremely useful um, uh, for someone who is trying to get an overall synthetic understanding of what, what you're trying to do. Thanks. I really like that. I know we're out of time, but I really like that idea, John. And it makes me think that surely in the digital era, we can we could if we thought creatively find some way to have the website where this is delivered, make those uh, those path make some of those pathways through the document more easy to navigate. Um, so if someone's interested in a particular topic, we could find ways to have them uh, be able to move from one chapter to the next without having to read them all and find the connections themselves. Uh, says the guy who's not a web developer, but it should be possible. Thank you. Any final thoughts from anyone? 
This has been so helpful. Thank you for spending these few hours with us. Incredibly helpful to us. Um, the ambition here is huge. The relevance is enormous. And um, uh, thank you for all you're doing on this. I, I think I speak for all of all of us involved in the assessment when I, I express our gratitude for the time you all are taking to review this. Um, you know, we're trying to be useful here. That's our goal, everybody. We that's very clear when we when we convene. And so, any help you can provide in making this assessment more useful, we will be very grateful, and we appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much.